euros 50 euro each. First come, first served in the Solomon Gallery, Friday 6th to Sunday 8th of April. The catch? You don't know the artist's name until you buy the art. Previewed at the Solomon on April 4th and 5th and on incognito.ie. Proudly supported by William Fry. The Six Nations on Off the Ball with Vodafone. Official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Triple Crown, the Six Nations, the Grand Slam, Ireland have done it all and at Twickenham against England in the most convincing manner. We're going to be looking back on it all for the next little while with Dennis Hickey who has joined us in studio and Johnny Murphy who is snowbound in Kildare but is going to join us uh, on the line as well. Dennis, you were there yesterday. It, it was a day in many ways without drama. It was, yeah. I, it was notable, I think, because of the... Um Ireland dominated so much. I thought even at 60 minutes, uh, the game was kind of was up, and in the stadium, we got a sense from the crowd, the English crowd. I was kind of looking around, um, people getting more and more frustrated, people leaving early. Uh, their worst fears, I suppose, were confirmed because I think because England had been on the road for two games, yeah. there was an expectation, and it, it, it was certainly an expectation I, I shared going into the match that playing at home would be different. They'd be different. Um, it's a very very difficult place to win Twickenham. And I think the uh, English support are kind of seeing things unfold in front of their eyes, what they've been watching on television, very, very disgruntled and very disillusioned, I think, leaving. And as I said, there's a lot of people leaving before the end, which you don't usually see in Twickenham. Can you put into some sort of context just how big an achievement this is, a third Grand Slam title, but also the first time since 1972 Ireland have gone away and won in both France yeah. and England in the same season? Yeah, um, you know, winning the Grand Slam is... Is, uh, is is well documented how difficult it is clearly because of the the um, the lack of the lack of wins. But I, I'm pretty sure most of those wins have come when the fixtures have been the other way around. When England played England and France at home, and uh, to go on the road at the start of the, the the tournament, play France away, and obviously win the way that they did, and then uh, those three games at home, and then having to go to England for the for the for finale. Uh, it does make the the achievement, I think, all the more significant. I think um, I certainly was a little unsure uh, if if I think after watching Ireland playing the three games in a row at home, you do kind of get l lulled into a false sense because you know when you see your team playing at home, it's very different to playing away. And they were they were so good in those games at at home, not infallible. You know, in, it, in every one of those games, they had patches where um, they were kind of left at the end of the game, thinking we've got to work on this bit, or you know, work on that bit. You know, the Scottish game obviously they created a lot of chances, that didn't convert. Wales, you know, with ten minutes to go, you're wondering how Wales is still in the game. So they had lots to work on. But when you get used to watching a team playing at home, you kind of start thinking they're maybe a little bit more invincible than they are and then the real test comes when you go away because it's such a it's it's such a change and for a team that gets used to them playing at home to go back on the road um so the fact that they were uh, the, the 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 grand slam was being bookended by those two away fixtures and uh, and they won them in, in in such a fashion was um, would have been particularly satisfying for the players uh, and gives them great confidence for uh, the years ahead when they know they can go into very hostile mm. environments and win so to be able to go to Twickenham and deliver that calibre of performance and to be so disciplined, to make so few mistakes. In a way, has Joe Schmidt almost taken the emotion out of Irish rugby? The playing at home, as you say, so often with that crowd behind you, you can get yourself pumped up and mm. quite often the opposition can't live with it. Whereas the way Ireland play now, they're not reliant on that either at home or away. They have a set style of playing and they know they can go out and execute it really no matter what the venue is. Well, I... I I think Ireland played with a lot of emotion yesterday. They played with a lot of passion. And I think that was one of the contrasts I thought between the two sides is that England, you know, watching the game in front of you, you know, sometimes on television you can not pick up on mm. uh, on those sort of things. But I thought England looked flat considering they're playing at home and they had so much at stake. You know, losing three games in the trot. I thought they would have played with a bit more passion. I thought they would have picked a team that maybe could have played with a bit more passion. Guys like Mike Brown, uh, who always brings a lot of that to his game. Uh, and they were they were a little um, passionless considering it was on the line for them. Whereas I thought actually Ireland, you know they've they've mixed 
both the, t- the technical excellence which they have it's controlled but they yeah but they really played with, with a lot of heart yesterday and they played with huge amounts of passion particularly at times when they were defending you know the Irish defence you know talk about the tries and the tries were fantastic but the Irish defence yesterday was incredible uh, and, and everyone was willing them not to concede a try at the end because they had defended so well they defended a period I know England ultimately scored in that first half but they were under the cosh for 10-15 minutes uh, with Omani in the bin yeah with Omani in the bin um, <coughs> England were going for driving malls uh, and they managed to be able to um, keep them out no matter what uh, and again that just showed to me that there's a, hel- there's, there's a lot more than just you know a, a very well polished a very you know technically and, and tactically well drilled team they're certainly not a team of robots. They they certainly played with a lot of heart yesterday, and and you need that I think to win in the uh, to win the tournament. We were discussing it um, before Dennis came in about hey, there's clearly Joe Schmidt's mark all over everything that this Irish team do, but that unlike some teams, more of the credit goes to the coach than the players. That it doesn't really matter what player is injured. We seem to be able to cope now. If we lost Sexton or Murray, we may have more of an insight into exactly how much depth we do have, but everyone seems to be interchangeable and and that is because of the coach and the system that he's put in place that the system fits no matter who has come in well i think it's fair to say true to say that ireland has the best squad in the six nations not just the best team and i think in maybe in, in years gone by certainly probably even in 2009 you would have said ireland had the best team but you know squad wise i think this 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 team is is uh, way ahead of anything that ireland well in 09 was it the same 22 for every single game yeah, I think it was an 18 close, player start of the five games. Yeah, something like that. Whereas, obviously, throughout this year, Ireland have used a lot more players. But this, to your point, it doesn't. The performance of the team isn't diminished by losing one or two players either from the start of the match or even interchanging during the game. And one of the things that Ireland have been able to withstand and they withstood it magnificently yesterday was a lot of disruption. They had a lot of guys going on and off. And that kind of changes of the, the 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 concentration, just goes slightly when you have to make it changes the combinations right up, right up to the end when Karen Marmion was coming on the wing, uh, which uh, which he's actually had to do before from yeah, if I remember against Australia. I guess, I guess I Australia. Yeah. Yesterday, I said it was against England, but I asked him after yeah, the game. Yeah, it was he's like actually had to do before two caps on the wing. So, what I mean, what does that say about Joe Schmidt? Obviously, it says about an awful lot about the players and their ability to be mm. flexible and adapt to these. Um, extenuating circumstances but you finish the game with a scrum half on the wing a fairly small guy mm. but physically isn't afraid of anything and a 20 year old in Jordan Larmer outside uh, Gary Ringrose he's 23 which one of our listeners corrected me and said he was 24 earlier and he said after the game Joe Schmidt that he had spent no time working on Jordan Larmer as a centre. Yeah, you could. So see, how does that? That's not, how do that's they not keep surprising. Because when I actually saw this home coming on, I was thinking there's no way he could have played uh, or done any sort of work at centre because he's barely played for Leinster mm. um, and he's played very little even uh, um, on the wing. He's played a lot more at fullback. So the fact he was in playing him centre in a match of that importance, I thought he played really well. Um, because I think it suited them as well at a time where England were trying to stretch Ireland um, and because they had to score uh, and they're throwing the ball around Larmers was able to use his pace to just um, uh, attract people down of which he has a lot of um, so yeah no, I, I think it just uh, the, the team the squad is at a certain level whereby um, everyone is very comfortable clearly with the systems they play and um, has the skill set to be able to execute under pressure so, so they're, 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 they're in a very good place in that respect Let's go to Johnny Murphy, who is listening in. Uh, Johnny, give us your thoughts on what we've been saying about Joe Schmidt and the style and the way he's been able to get this team playing. Yeah, I, I think you just look at the back row and you look at Dan Levy's performance yesterday. Um, like Dan wasn't a, a starter and there's been a few injuries, but I think you know he pushed Tyg Furlong all the way for the man of a match. I just thought he was absolutely immense. He's just created depth everywhere. I think probably Dave's right in terms of um, you know, when he says that if something ha- did happen, Connor or Johnny, then there might be a, a small difference. But Joey Carberry's come on twice in two really important games and closed the game out quite well. So, yeah, their depth is unbelievable. I think yesterday, massive thing for their defence, you know, to hold out for that 10 minute period or to, to defend like they did when Pete Romani was off the pitch was incredible. And that's been something that they've been getting a lot of flack for over the last four days, uh, over the last four games in terms of, you know, the defence out wide and how 
much pressure there under and where they've conceded those tries. So that was that was it was it was a huge performance defensively as well yesterday. What was different, Johnny, about about us in those wide positions yesterday? Because it was a massive day for Andy Farrell, wasn't it? Do some of the system that he was putting in place were being called into question over the last couple of weeks and maybe with, in, in a fair way justified because we had conceded a lot of tries in those wide areas so when you watched us yesterday and you're talking about how our defence has improved where did you see the improvement what were the reasons behind it? I think we just completely dominated the the rook area and England kept on making silly decisions there they they lost kind of the referee again in terms of the amount of penalties they were conceding that enabled us to get a really good fold and to keep bringing that repeated line speed that Andy Farrell wants to try and bring and then we didn't have really too many um decision making errors out wide our connections were good we turned our shoulders at the right times and we we hunted the ball correctly in terms of our hunt inside we kept coming forward and when they did duck back inside they were getting hit really hard on the um behind the gain line so it was just it was kind of an amalgamation of three or four things that they've been trying to get correct get get right and they all kind of they all kind of folded into place throughout the game yesterday the three tries, uh, all very different, but did they show all the very best aspects of Ireland's play, being able to uh, identify weaknesses and potential weaknesses maybe for the first try with uh, putting some pressure on the fullback straight away from Sexton, the genius of the move for the second try for CJ Stander, and then just having that moment of clarity just before half time. Firstly, to keep the ball in play to go, as Ireland have done throughout this championship, to try and get another score just before half time. But the awareness of both Murray and Stockdale to spot the gap on the inside to take advantage of it. Does all of that look as though it's stuff that's very much pre planned, stuff worked on the training ground? I'd say probably the last one is probably the one that's kind of just off the cuff. They see a 2v1 in the edge and they just take it. Uh, the two, the first one I'd say is definitely pre-planned. Anthony Watson wouldn't be renowned as the, probably the, in terms as secure under the high ball as Mike Brown would be. So that was something that they wanted to test early, obviously. And then I read this morning that uh, they've run that play actually against England before, but about three years ago, and it worked. I think Robbie Henshaw. Um, managed to get over the line as well so they just felt that the defensive system hasn't changed enough so they said if it worked once let's do it again and I think that just shows you the analysis that that probably and the depth of the analysis that does go on behind the scenes to you know Mervyn Murphy's background team Joe himself and that they feel that they can you know that they can uh an act and plaid tw- twice even though it's worked once and just say yeah let's let's have a go again and do it I just thought it, yeah, just on, the, on that first try in particular, um, the kick, uh, the the distance and the height of the kick, again, maybe off camera, you wouldn't have seen, like the, the, the wind was very swirly in the mm. stadium and it was absolutely inch perfect, the kick right mm. on the right on the try line. And uh, Watson, I, I'd agree with Johnny, isn't as renowned under the high ball as he is going forward. It would have been very, very difficult for any fullback to deal with it because yeah. it was of the, right of the high, money. and and uh, it just gave enough time for for uh, Rob Carney to be to be get in the air and just block the line of vision just for a split second. So it was the execution was perfect. Do you look at the way Ireland play and the way Leinster played down the years under Joe Schmidt and think I would love to have worked under him as a coach with the the level of detail, the clarity you would have had going onto the pitch? Well, yeah, like I, I worked with some some very good coaches in, in, in my time in Leinster and and uh, I was very lucky to do so. But yeah, he's he's. He's clearly, you know, certainly been the standard bearer in terms of coaching mm. in Ireland in recent years, and uh, um, the fact that his his style has adapted, I think, more to international rugby than probably uh, provincial shows that he, you know, realizes. Uh, exactly what's required to, to be successful in international rugby is different to playing week in week out, um, and the fact that they have a, a game plan, that a platform certainly that they're able to. Use and then vary uh, certain aspects of it depending on the opposition or you know that that try that the CJ standard try they've they've tried that uh, uh, move already this season in Six Nations it didn't work uh, I think one of the times they try to use it but it's incredible it's incredible to be able to you know with the way that the teams are set up with the pods and they go at the back mm-hmm. and they have forwards but it's just amazing how far, how much the game has developed when um, the fact that. Like every team can play these balls out the back now. That's not the that's not a differentiator. Every team wore rugby at all levels, club and uh, and country play those pods and the ball out the back. But the fact that you can actually build a, a game-winning move around a tight head prop 
uh, slipping a ball to, to you know, on a dummy feed to uh, a, a centre to lead to a try in a game of that importance with that much pressure just shows you a how good Tag Furlong is, but also how far the game has come. Who's calling that decision for that move at that time? I'd say they call that before the ball goes into the line out. Yeah, they call it in, and it's up Sexton, to Sexton, is it? Yeah, I don't know who would call. That. I don't know who calls. It. Probably Sexton calling that this is a move, but I wouldn't say there's much calling to be done in the sense that they know. I'd say everyone knows this. At this part of the pitch is a move that's this is a move they're likely to do. Um, they probably would. Unless would they only do it off the off a left hand line? Maybe they do. Or, um, but uh, I think everyone would know this is a, this is a this is the the the, uh, the part of the pitch where we play this move. Um, I don't know exactly what way they would call whether he slips it to the centre or he gives it at the back because they do variations of the same thing, um, which keeps teams guessing. Uh, or is it just up to Tug for long uh, at the time to give to whoever he wants? But I would say they probably pre-planned to, to pop it. And I mean, you would have been part of teams that have spent hours trying to execute a particular move on the training pitch, and when it comes off in a game and a game of the stakes of the one we watched yesterday how much satisfaction does that give you well, you've just in the moments after standards got that try well I can tell you I never played any I played, never played on any team where the, uh, uh, a, a game and a a, a, a um, a move of, of such in, in, intricacy would have right. gone through a tight end prop. <laughs> I never played in any team, uh, which would have been uh, the linchpin of the move would have been uh, de- dependent on that, and that's um, no uh, that's no reflection necessarily on the guys I play with, but it is a reflection of uh, what a good rugby player the tag for a long is. You know, he's an exceptional. I don't think there's any other team in the Six Nations who have a tight end prop could play that move, um, but the fact that he is the he's the he's the linchpin, teams defenses don't think he's going to do. Well, what that's he's done the fact that, that it is him is. Is key works. to the move, you know. Works, you know. That uh, we were saying earlier, it's this so uh, supposed overuse of the loop involving Sexton. Mm. So maybe turning that weakness into a strength, and then the unsuspecting tight head prop forward in the middle of the field is just expected to truck it up and take the contact. I mean, that's all part of the move. I the whole thing is concocted beautifully. Yeah. See, what Ireland have is is a um, huge amount of nuances off every single one of their plays, and and this is why they're able to retain the ball so much. This is why they're they're, they're you know the, the possession stats. I don't know what they finished up by yesterday. They were sixty percent at half time. But in the uh, the French match, I think there yeah, was. I think it was forty six percent. I think England, but obviously maybe their dominance uh, and having so much possession in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes. Well, of the game. it must have literally swung around those two periods because Ireland, I think they had 63 percent in the first match against France. They had sixty five percent against Italy, sixty seven percent against Wales. So they've dominated possession, and it's because they retain the ball so much now. Mm. You know, you could be. You can retain the ball by popping one off runners and just holding on to it and going nowhere. But what Ireland are able to do is they have very nuanced plays um, and they have three or four different options every time a ten gets the ball out the back. He can pop it to someone, a forward can pop it, pop forward can take it up. So all of a sudden, instead of it's a, it's not off nine or if it's off ten, there's kind of 13 or 14 variations that they're able to do and everyone is able to play mm. depending on what's being called. Adver- to be able to do that, uh, over 30 or 40 phases as they were shown they were able to do it in Paris and they did it at times yes they took England through numerous phases even in the lead up for that try just the Stockdale try uh, that's why they're a world class team Yeah uh, jo- Johnny on what Dennis is saying there and about the nuance in Ireland's attacking play at times the two words in, in all the analysis today that seem to keep coming up time and time again is how clinical Ireland are but also the clarity with which they play the game and the clarity they seem to have of the game plan and going back to last week Paul O'Connell after the game against Scotland saying that he feels Ireland can bring a different level of aggression than any other side because there is such clarity. Everybody knows what their job is, so then they can go and they can go attacking everything in an even more ferocious manner. To get that level of clarity at international rugby when you don't have the players every single day, I know they get decent camps together, but to get that level of clarity, is that the greatest achievement Joe Schmidt has managed during this campaign? Yeah, I think that was a, a kind of a, an eye-opener for any non-Leinster player when he took over. I remember I was in camp for the last two weeks when they won in uh, Paris and I remember speaking to Andy Trimble and I was like, oh, he, he'd just come back kind of after a small bit of a sabbatical and he was uh, playing the rugby of his life. I was like, oh, how, how are you enjoying it? And he's like, it's been the most uh, frightening four weeks of my life, life so far. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well... Everyone does analysis and you go through the day and when your downtime in previous camps, you'd, it would be your downtime where your downtime is you're analysing what you have to do and how you're going to do it. So he's just brought that through five, six years now. And, and, and I just think that everyone has that clarity so they don't 
need to work all they need to do is concentrate on their aggression levels and make sure that they can be in the right place at the right time they know they're going to be there so they then just have to be sure that they have that physical that physical edge um, like that everyone one of Joe's biggest thing most people will know where they're going to be for the first four or five phases and then as Dennis says they have you know three or four different shapes but they've got multi multi option multiple options off it which means they are quite unpredictable i know the media kind of is like well you know they play quite boring rugby but it's so clinical and so concise at times that it is you know it can be undefendable mm. they're, they're you look through one to 15 and there's a lot of interesting stories among every player i might almost go through them in in, in sections mm-hmm. and that starting then with the front row you touched on tyke furlong and being that world-class tight head but also keen healy all the injury problems he's had going from a position probably 18 months to years ago where he might have been fearful that he might have to retire and then in the centre of them Rory Best and his captaincy and the way he stepped up over can mm. you talk about those three and, and the real influence well, they've had on Ireland's progression yeah obviously we talked a lot about Tyke for a long already he's you know I think he'll probably be himself Sexton and Murray Certainly, if Leinster have a strong European Cup, he'd be there, thereabouts for World Player of the Year, I would say, by the end of the season. Is Furlong, is he a freak that Ireland are lucky to have? Or is he actually, when you look at these systems that are in place in Irish rugby that have been developed over the last 10, 15 years, is he almost a prototype of that coming I know, to fruition? I, th- I think it's a bit of both. I don't think you could create a player um, just out of the system, a player like him. Obviously, he's a, he's a very skillful player. He is uh, an incredible athlete. Like He holds 20 stone around for... 60, 70 minutes and I was watching him yesterday before they took him off and because I, I was thinking I wonder if they're going to bring Andrew Porter on but the impact at, the, at collisions the impact the clean outs he was doing like up to the minute before he was taken off um, was almost as intense as it was after the, the first couple of minutes so he's, an, he's a phenomenal athlete you know to, to, to be able to do that to be able to have, have that athleticism and engine just to be able to keep going considering what front row fours have to do mm. pushing, scrumming, rucking etc lifting and then the presence around the field and he's got great hands clearly he's got great hands he's a, he's a very good footballer as well so I don't think any system could just create a player like that I think he's he has uh, the best of both worlds really I think he's an innate footballer who's come through a system he's also a huge man like he's a huge huge guy um, outside I, of Sexton is he the most valuable member of the I team I think so well Murray I think Murray and Sexton I, I think and uh, and um, and uh, Furlong are the, are the three most I think for Kean Healy um, he's kind of one of the elder, one of the elder statesmen of the team now. He's he's had a very um, illustrious career. You know, he's had a lot of success, and his his. I was going to say his duel with Jack McGrath, but it's, it seems to be more of a partnership that they have. You know, they seem to get on quite well, uh, which in itself for front row competing uh, players is quite unusual. But because I think the modern game, they both expect to play. So do they? you think they see it that way? Well, I don't know. I don't know if they see it that way. But the they player see who's starting might see it that way. Yeah, well, you know, because I, I think as well, because it's been swings and roundabouts, they've, they've mm-hmm. both had their their time in the sun. and, and, yeah, and you, Jack, you, you, you would wonder, Keane Healy watching Jack McGrath yeah. over the last year, how much that's had to do with the upping his performance. A huge level. amount, huge amount. But I, I think the fact that they, you know, they both play in every game, both mm-hmm. for Leinster and, and, and Ireland, just some, one starts and the other doesn't. So, and, and the way that, certainly the way the squad system with Leinster in particular um, is that, you know, they, they both start probably uh, a large amount, but equal, almost an equal amount of games and they both play in an equal amount of games just depending who starts. But it's great to see him come back this year and uh, he's been able to build on a very strong season. I think having a full preseason last year mm-hmm. as well would have really helped him with his, his injury issues. Is it a part of the genes again of Joan that the two of the replacements for the front row yesterday they were so far out of favour in November they could barely get near the match day squad mm. let alone start against the mm. likes of Argentina and, and South Africa and that's Sean Cronin and Jack McGrath like we were asking questions around November what has happened to Jack McGrath why is Joe not um, favouring him in any way is it a Lions hangover Sean Cronin had fallen certainly into third position if not fourth mm. in terms of the hookers and yet their impact over the last couple of games have just been brilliant as well Like their appetite has been refired, fired up again because they were pretty much told you need to go back and improve he makes them work he ma- he's clearly a, a coach who makes people work for their position and they all are prepared to put in the work and they know if they do perform they'll get picked 
I think Jack McGrath at the end of last year for me looked like he was I think the Lions came at a wrong time for him I thought he looked tired by the end of last season he played a lot of rugby he played a lot of 80 minute matches at Lucid Prop uh, in the two seasons before the first season when he broke into the squad and then last year and I thought you could just see by the end of the season he was one of the players a little bit tired and the, and and I think it was natural then at the start of the season he got off to a slower start I think he needed a bit of a break and he, he got the break but he was a bit slower Keane Healy hadn't been on the lines mm. you know pre-season training etc so I wasn't I wasn't surprised to see but I think there's very little between them now um, which is a great position for both Leinster and Ireland clearly um, I think for Roy Best I, don't, I remember when Roy Best um, took over as captain and I was thinking to myself, oh, this is interesting because Rory obviously was a, a you know one of the younger players in the squad when I finished up in the last match. He was he was he was on the bench I think for that game, um, and he was still a, a personality uh, within the squad. Certainly seen as a kind of senior Ulster player even at that stage, but uh, he wasn't necessarily uh, a a standout candidate for being captain. Certainly when in two thousand and seven. Um, but it's amazing I was very interested to see then how he developed and it, it was a very you know I think Ireland had been used to very kind of totemic figures as captain up mm. to that point yeah. you had Keith Wood certainly you know the, during my time it was you had Keith Wood you had Brian O'Driscoll you had Paul O'Connell and uh uh, even though the most of, the bulk of Paul's captaincy was after I finished, he had filled in a couple of times. But he was a clear, he was the, the clear next captain. You know, I think I don't, I, I didn't think that was a surprise. Um, but they were very, as I said, very totemic figures. They were very clearly the best players on the pitch uh, from from an Irish perspective. Clearly recognised as such by the opposition. And Rory Best uh, was a, it was a different type of captain. And I was I was always curious to see how that would work. But actually, I think. I actually think the team is much more evenly um, led now. I think it's actually been so one the of the role key of the captain. Maybe isn't as significant. Well, as I, no, was. I still think he's a, he's 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 certainly the the team's captain. They all refer to him in, in with that with that uh, respect. Um, but because he's because he's not he's not the Brian O'Driscoll type, or he's, because he's playing hooker, he's, it's a, it's kind of a different. Yeah. He's a different dynamic, and he's a different way about him. Uh, and I actually think the team. Is much more balanced. I think a the leadership is more spread, and I think the ability is more spread. There's n- there's a number of significant leaders in that team, um, and I think it's one of it's been one of the keys to their success. Uh, the fact that uh, he has got the the respect of his team, he's led them to, and what he's achieved actually, no other Irish captain has achieved. You know, you think again, when you think about the great Irish captains, or you think, of, you know, you know, you look at what Brian achieved, or you think what Paul achieved, or Keith Wood. To that extent, none of them have had the success he's had all combined. You know, he's now he now has the Grand Slam, beat the All Blacks, first captain to lead uh, a team to win a Test down in South Africa. A lot of firsts um, as a captain, uh, so he's actually the most successful Irish captain. Yeah, Johnny, uh, is that one of the big changes from two thousand and nine? That maybe when we think of that team, it is about O'Driscoll, O'Connell, O'Gara, the clear, obvious leaders. Whereas right now, squad depth wise, it seems to be the load is shared somewhat. Yeah, definitely. I think if you watch games uh, live, you know, the amount of conversations that happen between Johnny, Connor, uh, even Rob Kearney to an extent, you know, Peter Armani, they all, you know, they all talk. And it was interesting yesterday, you know, you had three guys, the last three guys on on before they lifted the cup were Johnny, Pete and then uh, Rory lifted the cup. But Johnny and Pete lifted the triple crown. And I think that was, you know, I think that's significant, you know, and you look at Rob Kearney was in for a lot of flack kind of, um, over his position and then put under pressure from Jordi Lamar and then the whole Zebo thing. But he was immense yesterday. And I think that leadership and that know-how comes is the whole way from one to 15 is the whole way from one to 15. They obviously have leaders in every unit and they're all very, you know, they're all very important. There's a senior player group, the likes of Keith Earls, he's involved in that, you know, so there's leaders littered the whole way throughout the squad. I think, I think as well about Rory, he's, he's quite, he's, he seems to, he strikes, uh, he strikes a, um, a sense of kind of a paternal figure. He's not a shouter and roar mm. and, you know, it's all about him, it's all about him as the captain. Um, uh, he's a very, he, he, you know, he's a he's a lovely, he's a really really lovely fella. Um, and even as a, a younger player, he was, you know, was a very warm kind of character, very approachable. Um, would talk to everyone, um, and you could see him uh, in that role as someone. You know, he's the he really is the elder statesman, and he's been through a lot, uh, and he has that respect of uh, of all the young players. And you've got to remember, this team has 
I think there was 10 guys yesterday that played 25 and younger. Um, so it's a very, very young profile team, which is fantastic for where Ireland are going. Yeah. If you think about 10 of the team being 25 or younger, it's, it's, that's an that's a, that's incredible statistic for where, for where Irish rugby is going to be in a couple of years. I know we're 7-8 and we're conscious that we're talking to two wingers about mm. how these front row players are going oh, yeah. and, how, and how well they, they played over the last few years. I've listened to many four, front row <laughs> forwards talk about, uh, about back play and wing play, I can tell you, <laughs> over the years. But Johnny, we were talking about you know the valuable players in the squad and they're obviously all valuable but in terms of guys we can't afford to lose and we're Furlong Murray and Sexton were the three but you look at the hooking positions and by the time Japan rolls around Sean Cron's going to be 33 and Rory Best going to be 37 are either of those or both or one in your eyes going to be playing in this World Cup and if one or both are not there would you be worried about what's coming up from behind? Um, well I think uh, Scan's obviously a monster he, he was in the mix there and then he got injured mm. Um, but it is probably one of the positions that we probably lack a tiny bit of depth in. Um, Rory signed a new contract, looks like probably till the end of the World Cup. So, you know, hopefully fitness perm- fitness permitting, he gets there. Um, and I think Sean Cronin doesn't show any signs that he won't be there either. So, But it is important that they do stay fit. Um, outside that, you obviously have Rob Herring and James Tracy, guys who have relatively little exposure. So there probably might have to be a small bit more opportunity given to those guys throughout. But it's important that they try and get game time for their provinces to start off. And then after that, that they if they do get an opportunity, they take it. But yeah, it's probably one of the areas just with how important those two lads are. But then again, like people were saying, you know, during the autumn, we did pretty well during the autumn and Sean Cronin wasn't involved at all. So there is there is probably a small bit more depth, but it is one of those positions that, like 9 and 10, you would be a small bit wary that if we lost someone, then there might be a tiny bit of an issue. All our Six Nations coverage on Off the Ball is with thanks to Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. We have Dennis Hickey in studio, Johnny Murphy on the line as well. There's a lot more we want to get through and go through some of the other lines in the Irish team and just how well they've performed and where we're going to head from here looking towards 2019. But we'll take a quick break. The Six Nations on Off the Ball with Vodafone. Official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Find yourself correctly predicting the future. Knowing what people are going to do before they do it. Finishing other people's sentences. No. You can't predict the future. When overtaking a cyclist, allow plenty of room. For zones of 50k and under, allow at least 1 metre. For zones over 50k, allow at least 1.5 metres. You can't read the mind of a cyclist and they can't read yours. Don't second guess. You may not get a second chance from the Road Safety Authority. Get 20% off all car seats, travel systems and strollers in the baby room at Smith's Toy Superstores. That's 20% off all car seats, travel systems and strollers in-store and online until the 22nd of March, while stocks last. Pick up a free copy of our new baby catalogue. Try our free car seat fitting service and discover incredible new ranges in-store now. Visit the baby room at your local Smith's Toy Superstore today. Maybe you're just worn out. Work and the grind of daily life is getting to you, and you've lost your lust for life. But maybe there's a different reason. If you're a man over 50, experiencing symptoms such as tiredness, loss of libido, and feeling a bit down, you may be one of the 8% of men in Ireland who has testosterone deficiency, or TD. The good news is testosterone deficiency can be treated. Talk to your doctor and find out more at whatistd.ie, a disease awareness campaign by Bezins Healthcare. Imagine driving the stylish and intelligent Audi A3. Well, now you can with an incredible APR of just 1.9%. Makes you think, doesn't it? This is a limited offer, so call your local Audi dealer today while stocks last. Audi. Vorsprung Dirk Technik. Terms and conditions apply. Typical finance example, A3 Sportback, 1 litre, TFSI attraction, on the road, €29,210, deposit 8851 36 monthly payments of 249 optional final payment, 12195 Total cost of credit, 950 including acceptance fee, €75, Euro, and completion fee, €75. Euro. Minimum deposit, 10%. Subject to lending criteria, higher purchase agreement, Audi Finance is a trading style of Volkswagen Bank GmbH Branch Ireland is authorised by the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority in Germany 
and regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland for conduct of business rules. As Ireland celebrates an incredible Grand Slam triumph, the Sunday Independent reflects on a day to remember for Irish sport with our top team, Brendan Fanning, Neil Francis, Bernard Jackman and Eamon Sweeney. We pick our team of the tournament, look at the moments that cemented this team's place in history and ask what next for this golden generation of players. The Sunday Independent, the complete read. No one wants to think about an emergency at home. No one wants to think about coming home late at night when your key snaps in the front door lock, leaving you and your family stranded on the doorstep in the freezing cold. But there is an insurance company that does think about it. AXA Emergency Home Assistance is a service you can call day or night. They'll send a tradesperson to provide an emergency repair and get things back to normal ASAP. Makes you think, doesn't it? Bring normal back with four free emergency home assistance call-outs a year when you have AXA Home Insurance and no impact on your premium. Search AXA Emergency or call 1890 24 7 365. Mm-hmm. Terms and conditions apply. AXA Insurance DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Right now at Homebase, there's three for two on all wallpaper. That's great value for your bank holiday. Hurry, offer ends Monday. Homebase, always your home, always low prices. Cheapest item free. The wait is finally over. Introducing the Samsung Galaxy S9 smartphone. Now available SIM free at Harvey Norman with its revolutionary camera that adapts like the human eye, captures stunning pictures in bright daylight and super low light. Buy the Samsung S9 SIM free at Harvey Norman and you'll be free from a contract, free to pick your own network and free to spread your payments. Experience the freedom of SIM free with Harvey Norman. Break free and take charge of your phone. See harveynorman.ie for details. The Six Nations on Off the Ball with Vodafone. Official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. You're welcome back to Sunday's Off the Ball. Nathan and Dave in studio. We're joined by Dennis Hickey as well. And Johnny Murphy is still on the line. We are reflecting on the Grand Slam. If you haven't heard and you're planning on going to the Aviva Stadium, well, head back home, sit down. You can probably uh, relax in front of the TV for the afternoon because it has unfortunately been cancelled because of the weather conditions. Johnny, we've been talking then about the front row and maybe uh, the age profile of the two hookers heading towards 2019. One area where we don't need to worry about the age profile and something we could be really excited about is the second row and the emergency of James Ryan and Ian Henderson as well who maybe has been overshadowed a little bit by what James Ryan has done during this championship I remember during the World Cup there was a few concerns about what you might lose from Henderson's game as he moves from the back row into the second row those concerns seem to have completely evaporated Yeah definitely I think he just offers another dimension from the second row James Ryan has been immense um, probably a surprise that he to some people that he got kind of the shot ahead of Devon Toner but he yesterday he it's his double triple quadruple efforts in, in, a, in a time that you know his engine just looks incredible but he has the skill set as well um, I don't know who's calling the line outs at the moment but I, I think um, I think know, it was Henderson Johnny he, was doing yesterday, yesterday just yesterday. From looking down on the field at it yeah, well, you see, like the, you know, there's obviously an intelligence level across the the back, you know, the the second row. Then that they can all call the lineouts, especially with someone like Dev coming off the bench. So, yeah, that's certainly an area. You know, you look at the guys that we. It, that's the thing, like the amount of players that have been used throughout the last, you know, even the Six Nations. You look at Quinn Rue, he he, he featured. You know, Alton Delan, there's loads more. Ty Byrne you know, coming back. Ty Byrne as well, you know. So there's a huge amount of of depth in that area. Um, you know, Alton Delan is someone that, you know, two years ago we thought he was going to be a starter for the years to come and injuries and, and then just the emergence of James Ryan has just put him on the back burner a small bit. Yeah, James Ryan followed in the footsteps of Brian O'Driscoll made his Ireland debut before he made his Leinster debut and that can be difficult when there's so much hype around you and so much expectation and you are in your very early 20s not every player can go and deliver on that but to not just deliver but to step up during the Six Nations and, and suddenly it's either Henderson and Toner alongside Ryan mm. I um, I watched him and certainly at the, at the opening exchanges for a guy of his age uh, 21 he incredibly physical for a second row uh, of that age. You know, usually, considering he's going to get bigger in the next two or three years, he'll be a lot bigger than he is now mm. because he's a very lean frame. He's a very you know six foot eight. He's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of frame which he's going to put weight on it as he gets a little bit older. So even by the World Cup, he'll be bigger again. But but uh, with respect to the level of physicality in the exchanges, right from the off, he was made a couple of really really big hits. And Henderson is the same. Like Henderson is. One of these guys who you know he never doesn't he's not a shouter and roar he just gets on with 
a huge amount of work and uh, holding held up uh, the English attack at one point for a critical turnover and a, to, 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 for the referee to call a mall so Ireland would get the put in and he does he, he does a lot of that for, for Ireland and two incredibly valuable players to build uh, a team around and, and Devon Toner uh, has has really stuck to the fact that he's he's obviously been displaced in the side but um, he's made an impact I think in every game he's come on because uh, he's very difficult clearly for, for uh, a sub hooker and he usually is a sub hooker on he, he's up against you know, so for George to mm. come on and then Devon Toner comes on and straight away he's got to navigate the 6 foot 10 uh, player who Ireland could throw up. It's a very, um, it's a very, uh, it's a nice secret weapon to. Well, not much secret. It's a nice weapon to bring on um, when the sub hooker is trying to find his feet early on after being brought on. So I think that between the three of them and, and as Johnny said, the, the other guys who aren't there, they're very strong in that position. It's probably a credit to the consistency of performance of Peter Mahoney and CJ Sander that actually we haven't spoken a huge amount about them during this Six Nations. So I just meant to say, by the way, uh, at, the, at the end of the match, I was watching James Ryan run up and down along the touchline giving high fives to all the supporters and I was thinking to myself you know, <laughs> 21 years of age five matches for Ireland never lost one of them oh, at a grand slam you know uh, he must know what as he's as we were done. saying he's never lost a match for Leinster he, can't, he, he couldn't possibly understand what he's achieved at this stage at 21 you can't, you can't do what it what is it so saying about clearly these guys are physically primed and conditioned coming out yeah. of the school system we're way ahead of the, the rest of the pack in a lot of ways that you can almost throw them into the professional ranks when they leave school but it's emotionally mentally nothing seems to phase them like he's going up against George Cruz and Mario Otoji um, now granted Otoji's only two years older than him but he's a, so much experience he's a British yeah. and Irish lion yeah. up against Alan jones in the game against against the Welsh it, it just seems that no matter what it is that you're willing to throw at James Ryan no, he just flicks player, it all yeah. away and he's and he's absolutely fine about it again he's been a captain of underage teams so he's he's, he's a leadership qualities um, that probably belies his ears you know yeah uh, Johnny on the back row then maybe we've come complacent because we've so much strength and depth but then you only have to and you look at most of the leading teams in world rugby the back row is an area of real strength but you watch the way England have had an absolute disaster at the breakdown and with their back row players struggling for form maybe we should give more compliments to this Irish group and Dan Levy's performance in particular but also the guys who missed out Josh van der Fleer going to be out for the rest of the season Reese Ruddock who we know Joe Smith is a huge fan of and will certainly be thinking of forcing his way back in as well Sean O'Brien <laughs> Sean O'Brien he's up having Conan. to retire the, the list goes on Conan. and on and on Jack, Jack Conan. Conan as well like, yeah. it, it's frightening the, the reserves that Ireland have in place now in the back row yeah, and all playing really well for their provinces as well. It's not a, you know, it's not, it's not a form issue. There's at least seven or eight guys that you can have a conversation about whether they're going to start or, or not. And yeah, it's just incredible. You know, the likes of, you know, even the guys up in Ulster, you know, uh, that you know have been capped, Sean Reedy, Chris Henry, these guys. They're they're like, they're completely forgotten about now. But they they were only used within the last 12 18 months so yeah it's just the the back row is is a frightening area and something that we definitely have a, a lot of riches in mm. do you want to get to a stage by 2019 Dennis where you know you're starting back row where it's nailed on who the three are going to be or do you want to keep this level of competition right up to the start of the tournament yeah no I don't think I don't think Ireland needs to do that I think as I said the the, the, the reason um, Ireland are the grand uh, slam champions is because they have the strongest squad not because they have the strongest team um, and the, the reality is people will get injured uh, and that that uh, those every, across the board uh, and in the back row in particular it's very attritional uh, and we could be talking about three completely different player system mm -hmm. next year. We never mentioned Ian Henderson and Ty Byrne when it comes to back row options, both of whom have a very good chance of playing in those roles if absolutely necessary. Yeah, uh, Ty Byrne's int introduction to Irish rugby is going to be very interesting mm -hmm. to see where he fits into all this. Yeah. Uh, go on, Johnny. Yeah, no, and you look at how he played last week against Leinster uh, over... Um, over in Parky Scarlet, he got that penalty last minute that um, enabled him to get a draw over there. Like his performance levels over the last six, well, probably eighteen months, two years have just been, uh, you know, incredible. He's actually ve probably one of the most unlucky guys not to even have had an introduction into the squad, given that um, he is he has given a commitment that he's coming home. You know. Yeah. Uh, talk to us, Dennis, about. 
Johnny Sexton and Conor Murray then the level of performance and and their role within the team has has it changed this Six Nations compared to the last two three seasons well I think to have one of those two playing uh, you know being the leading uh, exponent of their uh, in their field would be would be remarkable to, but to have two of them playing so well at the moment um, there's there's uh, you know obviously there's Bowden Barrett in the Southern Hemisphere to, to, to rival Johnny but apart from that it really is just the two of them I think um, Owen Farrell has sl- slipped down the pecking order after a kind of indifferent Six Nations he's a, he's a class player clearly but he, it didn't really happen for him in the Six Nations and Dan Bigger had his issues as well uh, and Finn Russell was kind of hot and cold so it's really those two are head and shoulders but I think Conor Murray for me, is is uh, the best number nine by some distance at the moment. I just think his all round, uh, his all round game management. He, he he never ever looks like he's under any sort of stress. Now that's a uh, that's also a function of the, of the work that Ireland do around ball presentation and and the speed of the ball compared to even England yesterday, where Wigglesworth was digging the ball out so often, whereas Murray gets the ball on, on, uh, presented to him so easily. But he's. Um, He's an incredible all-rounder. He, he has every facet to his game. He's got a great pass, uh, inch-perfect box kicks. Um, uh, such a danger in the fringes as well. Such a danger in the fringes. He's very physical in defence, so uh, he's uh, he's perfectly at home and, uh, and clean. Get a look, and now can kick goals. But <laughs> he really is the complete player. He really is the complete player. You know, it's it's um, uh, the the fact that Ireland have him and he's playing so well. For him, if he was to get injured, touch would be a disaster. But uh, I think the way um, the two of them are playing together as well, they've really kind of forged a really, a really strong partnership there. And uh, uh, you know, that's that's what I think all the other teams are missing. But our depth has improved at nine, hasn't it? Even in the last six months, we yeah. knew Kieran Marmon was coming on bit by bit. I'm not talking about you know putting Conor Murray in a position where he's under pressure for his starting slot but the season that John Cooney has had in Ulster and Luke McGrath was just going brilliantly until he picked up an injury so you would hope that going into 2019 that maybe losing Conor God, we hope that won't happen but if you were to be in that position that we're not actually as um, hard up as we might have been no, I think you know. I think there are all, all those names that you mentioned have been playing well for their provinces at, at, at different times. I just think the gap is so big because yeah. of the quality of Murray, as opposed to it certainly uh, the lack of be quality seamless. below him. Yeah, I just yeah. think it would be he would be a hard position to absorb. But you know, hopefully, we don't need to have that conversation. <laughs> Johnny, I know you got ahead shortly, but just a couple of questions before you go. Just on that uh, backup, then for Murray and Sexton, Ireland go to Australia during the summer and have a huge amount of momentum behind them. Mm. Do you bring your first choice group and Murray and Sexton or do you actually think World Cup 18 months away let's leave these guys back at home let's give them that rest it'll serve us well in the long run you get the younger players a bit more experience but maybe maybe you end up losing a bit of momentum you get from the Six Nations yeah, I, I I think he's probably going to go full out just because you know you need to have the experience of winning in the Southern Hemisphere. The majority of them have done it in um, in South in South Africa. They've beaten you, New Zealand, obviously. So I think Australia is probably something that that for this current crop. And I know guys have done it before, but they're really you know that option has to, that has to be there to to add another layer to this to the to the squad as an entirety. I, you know, we're you're lucky, and a lot of people gave out. A lot of Ulster people gave out about Ruben Pinar and the fact that he left uh, was was made leave. Um, but that opportunity that is given Cooney, it shows that the IRFU and their protocols are they're in place and they they work. You know, we have four live options at nine. Oh, Dennis is completely right. There's no way that people are going to be putting. Um, pressure on, on Connor. It just he is just that far ahead of the game. He's probably the best in world rugby. So, but we do have depth there, and that is down to the decision that the RFU have made, whether you like them or not. But that depth is there going forward. Good stuff, Johnny. We'll let you go. Thanks a lot for taking the call, Johnny Murphy. Cheers, was, uh, thanks, many Snowbound guys. in Kildare. You can go and build your snowman now. Uh, all our Six Nations coverage on Off the Ball. With thanks to Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team, we all belong to the team of us. Dennis, what would you do going to Australia then with Sexton and Murray? I, it's a difficult conversation to go to Johnny Sexton and say, you're staying yeah. at home for the summer. It's the best thing in the long term. But it is the best thing in the long term, isn't it? Like You saw how well, obviously, Paddy Jackson hasn't been unavailable this time around, but how well Paddy Jackson, a number of other players, cheering O'Halloran um, Luke Marshall they were they were superb in South Africa, Africa when yeah. we had no Johnny Sexton I, I, I'm not sure um, 
I'm not sure, actually, to be honest. I think that uh, there's a logic, clearly, to keep the momentum going and, and winning a Test Series or trying to win a Test Series in Australia. Um, and it's still 18 months out. Uh, I think... Are Ireland actually in a different position there in comparison to other countries that oh, they can bring Murray and Sexton and then turn around to the provinces and say, actually, we don't want to see these lads playing until October when the Champions Cup starts again? Well, of course they can. And, and that's, I think, even... their The ability, you know, and... and Ireland win the Grand Slam yesterday and the IRFU um, have to take a huge amount of credit because of the way they run the game in Ireland and you know there's been lots of since the game went professional about what the best way is to run the game and but but you only had to look at yesterday I thought England England have a number of really world class players who to me look really tired like uh, Atoje I think is a great example mm. he, this time last year he was head and shoulders above everyone uh, in, in certainly in the English pack and he had a fantastic line series, but he has looked hard the entire Six Nations. And I think a really interesting stat coming into the into the Six Nations that he had played something like eight hundred and fifty minutes of rugby before the Six Nations started this season. And Tyke Furlong had played two hundred and seventy minutes of rugby, uh, and Johnny Sexo had played two hundred and seventy minutes of rugby. Uh, and that's the problem when you're serving two masters; uh, you've got to play when you're told to play. Uh, whereas Ireland have control of the players, so it's not it's not impossible to think that. Uh, that by the time Ireland even get to go to Australia, the Johnny Sexton won't, won't, won't have played a huge amount of rugby. He's played a lot, clearly, in the Six Nations. The last five weeks, or eight weeks, whatever, he's, he's racked up a lot, and now we're getting to the business end of Europe, and you would expect uh, Leinster to be, to, be, to be close to having a good run, um, though, obviously, anything can happen. Um, I'm just looking at the calendar here. We play in Brisbane on the, June, on the 9th of June. If Leinster have made a Champions Cup final in Bilbao on May 12th, I don't think that is enough of a turnaround for a guy who'll have played a good bit of rugby, battered and bruised as he walked off that field yeah. yesterday. The linchpin of this team. I just don't see the I don't see the benefits of Johnny Sexton. Even if we go down there and win and play well. I mm. don't see well, the you do overall potentially benefits. have a Pro fourteen final two weeks after that, May twenty sixth mm. as well. So Like is is there is, there's no need for it. In the one position perhaps and we've been talking about Hooker and Scrum Half, but really ten where we just don't have a guy that you're happy to come in and do the job right now, M- mainly because he, Sexton's been so good and he's been injury-free this time around, that Joey Carberry, Ross Byrne, Ian Keatley, whoever it might be, they are not getting any time, consistent time in big tests from the start in the 10 jersey. So what an opportunity. Yeah, no, there's no doubt that there's a great opportunity to, to, to have all those players have a shot and play international rugby in the year before the World Cup. Um, so I, you know, I think both arguments are sound to have uh, the momentum and to, to keep going with the with having Sexton and Murray involved or to not have them involved. I, I don't think you're going to... I think you'll, you'll um, get what a result you always. What would I do? Um, I don't know. I think there's a... I think there's a uh, there would be a lot of value in leaving them behind um, but you know winning is important as well and they want to make sure that they keep winning and uh, with that halfback combination they give themselves a better chance of winning so you know, I wouldn't underestimate the value it's not, it's not a development tour going on they mm. to Australia to play three tests so very, are we getting very, close very, very to be in a position we can go to Australia without those two and win um, I certainly think you know, the team is strong. It's as strong as it's ever been. The squad is strong. So you know they'll they'll no matter who they're playing, uh, home or away, Ireland are competitive. Um, uh, and uh, whether they have their, they ha- if they had this fifteen starting from yesterday or a variation of it, they'd be competitive no matter who they're playing or where they're playing. So I have plenty of confidence in 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 that element. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. We might fly through the back line. What's Ireland's best centre partnership? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. I don't I really don't know the answer to that. I think it's great to see Ringwells come back yeah. and play in two big games. Um, and he was better again against England than he had been against Scotland, which is expected after being out for so long. Um, and he's clearly he's hitting for he's going to hit for at the right time now. Certainly for Leinster, if you're looking at Leinster, he's 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 come back and played in two big games. He's very competitive yesterday. Very abrasive. Um, uh, he's certainly someone who Ireland are going to be able to build an attack and defence around. And I think, uh, but I think Farrell has been excellent every time he's played for Ireland. He was very unlucky not to um, not be in a position to get picked for for um, the last two games. But yeah, they've, again, there's a lot of competition there. Uh, Bundyaki uh, clearly uh, performed in his first Six Nations and Henshaw, and there's a couple of others as well. So again, it's it's a it's a, it's an area where Ireland have a lot of options, which is great. Mm. 
you were talking about uh, Keith Earls off air and yeah. maybe somewhat overshadowed in ways by Jacob Stockdale and just mm. the sensational uh, try scoring run he's gone on in the Six Nations. Uh, Earls, the way he's changed from when he first started out with Ireland to the role he has in the team now, have you seen that? Yeah, he's a real leader now. You can see, you can clearly see he um, he's he's one of the elder, again one of the elder statesmen in the team, and he has become more comfortable clearly with his leadership role. But I, I just thought throughout the Six Nations, not just yesterday, um, he's been one of Ireland's really consistent performers. He's really aggressive uh, with and without the ball. He's really good in the air going forward, which is a key um, a key skill you got to have with the go uh, with the Joe Schmidt game plan. Um, uh, his acceleration is 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 undiminished by age which you would expect he's not he's, you know he's one of the older guys but he's not old um, and his acceleration yesterday when he I, I thought he made the right decision to try to come in and, and stop the ball uh, and he just you know it was excellent pass by by, um, by the English back line just missed out and slightly but the fact that he was able to turn and still catch Elliot Daly with a tap tackle you know really well, really he's turning quick. as well if, when you look back at the footage he's turning before the ball arrives in Elliot Daly's hands he yeah, realises he realizes he's, he's missed it, it yeah exactly and he's turning he hasn't given up and, and that's I think that's kind of that sums him up really because he's he's competitive right to the end he chases every kick chases every ball in the air uh, he is perfectly happy in the physical stuff and uh, he's he's been a leader uh, himself and Rob Carney two experienced head heads with uh, the young Stockdale on the other wing has made for a very um, a very strong Irish back three even one of the iconic moments in, in a tournament of many of them was Keith Earl's pursuit of was it uh, Benvenuti in the mm. last couple of minutes of, against Italy in a game that was already done we were beating them by 30 odd points and he's got the desire to cover that ground and put in a try-saving tackle. That kind of just summed up how, how well he played in this tournament. And we did go, come into this tournament with people questioning the back three and what the best selection was be and a lot of talk of Simon Zebo and the outrage that he wasn't allowed to be involved in this campaign. Mm -hmm. That's gone very quiet and you touched on Rob Carney there. He was at the centre of an awful lot of that attention under huge pressure from Jordan Larmer at full back but stepped up again and again and again. Mm. Is that it? All questions answered ahead well, of 2019? Well, like I, I, I don't think the uh, just because the back three has played very well, the Simon Zebo question uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, wasn't valid. You know, I think the fact that he was omitted was was very very hard, uh, considering he's still playing in Ireland. But putting that aside, um, I think uh, yeah, there was a lot of questions about who the best back three were going to be. Even after November, it wasn't immediately clear who. Uh, Schmidt would pick going into the Six Nations but each one of those three have been immense in every game I think Rob Carney has had his certainly the, one of the best seasons he's ever had for Ireland uh, and that can happen you know you, you, you can't have a career with the, the the length duration that Rob has had and the success he's had you know he's got two Grand Slams Three. He's the most successful player in yeah. the history of Irish rugby. Yeah, three Heineken Cups. No, three no one has racked up what he's racked you up. Know, she, uh, he's, he's won everything, really, and he's, he's been on the lines a couple of times as well. He's an incredibly decorated player. So the fact that he still has the hunger, inevitably he was going to get injured at some stage during his career. Um, and uh, the fact he's bounced back. And, you know, he was... He was really written off at one point. Um, not a, not a, he was he was given very little um, respect. I thought, considering the career he had, he was finished. He was no good. He wasn't up to it. He was going to get replaced by everyone, and uh, he kept his counsel and just got on with getting better. And he played, you know, away from the lights and and just kept getting better and better for Leinster. And he's been. He's he's been so solid this year for Ireland, and his his attacking game, his counter attacking game, has been the strongest it's ever been. He's so hard to stop this the way he spins out of the tackle, and he always gets that extra yard. And he's been a real clearly he's been a real calming influence at the back, and uh, I was delighted to see him play so well this year. So to wrap up, and we'll let you go after this. Where's Joe Schmidt going to be looking at for Ireland to improve between now and next year's Six Nations, and now in the World Cup? <laughs> Say that again. Where, where's Joe Schmidt going to be looking? What areas of the pitch can Ireland really go and improve in? Oh, like I, th I think he'll. I don't know. Like I don't know Joe Schmidt. I never, uh, I never uh, was coached by him. But he doesn't strike me as someone who uh, won't have have had a, a notebook full of things he believes that Ireland didn't get right in the Six Nations. I think he'll see lots of things that they have to improve on. Which is, you know, I think in every one of their games they had they had uh, they had patches in the game when they didn't perform as well as they sh they could have. Mm. Um, and it was a strength. It was obviously a, a, a testimony to both their skill level and their character. They were always able to to win those close close games. But there was plenty to work on from from all those games. Um, and I think 
uh, he'll focus on two things. He'll focus on continuing to develop the leadership capability within the team uh, and bringing those younger players through. Uh, he'll focus on the squad rather than the team and on making sure he has two or three options in every uh, in every um, position, which again has been the hallmark of his, his reign is that we've had no, we've rarely been able to feel the team that we've wanted that we've probably on paper wanted to be able to feel up till maybe the last couple of rounds of the Six Nations last round of the Six Nations but so I think he'll focus on bringing players through and making sure that some of the areas that we talked about um, uh, that are that maybe Ireland have, have a little less clarity on who the, the third choice player might be I think he'll focus on that um, and I think he'll focus on managing his players I think he'll make sure that uh, he controls who uh, who is available to play uh, and as we get closer and closer to the World Cup uh, having that ability to determine um, uh, how those resources are used is going to be a key factor in determining how successful Ireland because not every team can do that that's a that's a, a strategic advantage that Ireland have and they've got to be able to leverage that to make sure in their position to, to, to perform to the best in the World Cup We've never got to a World Cup semi-final so last question Dennis because it's something I was talking to a couple of people about yesterday mm. expectation Mm. We are now the second ranked team in the world. We really New Zealand is the only team that that yeah. we would feel on any given day we may struggle to beat. Mm. So we should be targeting a World Cup final, should we not? Like is even the way Joe Schmidt can control all the controllables better than any coach we've ever had. How does he manage the expectation? Because we've seen in previous World Cups, oh seven in particular, where we may be as fans and, and pundits mm and commentators lose the run of ourselves. Well, you can't do a lot about that. You can't do a lot about uh, people outside the team losing the run of themselves, and that's that's a that's a, um, a, nat- a national fault as opposed to uh, anything <laughs> to do with the Irish, <laughs> to do anything with the Irish team. And um, uh, probably coming from New Zealand, he probably finds that uh, uh, difficult to get to grips with. But um, that's going to happen anyway. I think what this team has been very comfortable with is dealing with the weight of expectation. They've rarely, if ever, apart from that last World Cup, and they've, they're a very different team, even I'd say, um, mentally than they were at that World Cup. But since that day, they've been able to deal with all expectations. Um, so I think they're 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 very well placed to do that. But yeah, it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a job to be able to manage that. We've another whole Six Nations cycle to go through, and a lot can happen. Yeah, just like, look at England. Just you all you have to do is look at England. To you know, they went into this tournament twenty two out of twenty two out of twenty three games won in a row. Um, uh, the last uh, only Ireland had beat them in the Six Nations they'd won 22 out of 23 and, and um, everything been questioned now and everything has been questioned now so things can unravel very quickly and I don't think that'll be lost on either Joe Schmidt or any of the, any of the players to that matter um, so I think they'll just continue as they say to do to, to, to focus on the process and focus on the next game and while that might seem like um, uh, media speaks to, to keep everything a lid on it I think they found a way to manage expectations amongst themselves and to focus on um, the bigger picture uh, while navigating uh, the individual hurdles along the way. And I think they'll, they're, they're well positioned to do that. A little bit more work for Joe Schmidt to do because Romania have been confirmed as being in Ireland's group for the World Cup. Belgium beat Spain earlier today, so that means Romania are going to be in Ireland's group. Controversy at the end, though, the referee was Romanian. Uh, so we'll uh, find out a little <laughs> bit how that more works. about that. Uh, you, we'll give you a little bit of time to uh, conduct some analysis on the Romanians before we start asking yeah. you what sort of a challenge they're going to pose. We, we expect 300 pages of written notes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, we know one man who'll certainly have it. Brilliant stuff, Dennis. Thanks a lot for joining us in the studio today. All our Six Nations coverage on Off the Ball is with thanks to Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. There is, despite the snow, quite a bit of live sport going on in Gaelic football, in hurling and in the FA Cup. We'll run you down through all that in a moment and we still have plenty more rugby to come as well our Sunday pay-per-view coming coming up shortly with Hugh Farrelly and Dan McDonnell The Six Nations on Off the Ball with Vodafone official sponsors of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us Moncrief Another person says, I'm fuming. That Grow It Yourself programme was excellent. We've taken an allotment and it's really helpful for beginner gardeners.